JavaScript is moving so fast. It's not easy to keep up with all of the frameworks, build tools, and packages. No other language spans front-end to back-end, mobile to web to server. Sasha Grief is an independent designer and developer, most prominent in his roles as co-author of Discover Meteor and community builder at Sidebar.io, which is a design newsletter with over 35,000 subscribers, and Hacker News Kansai. He's currently best known in the JavaScript community as the maintainer of Vulkan.js, and for his annual State of JavaScript survey, which is now open for 2017, if you're interested in contributing to that survey. In this episode, Sean Wang guest hosts a discussion about both projects and Sasha's thoughts on independent web design and development. Spring is a season of growth and change. Have you been thinking you'd be happier at a new job? If you're dreaming about a new job and have been waiting for the right time to make a move, go to Hired.com slash SE Daily today. Hired makes finding work enjoyable. Hired uses an algorithmic job matching tool in combination with a talent advocate who will walk you through the process of finding a better job. Maybe you want more flexible hours or more money or remote work. Maybe you want to work at Zillow or Squarespace or Postmates or some of the other top technology companies that are desperately looking for engineers on Hired. You and your skills are in high demand. You listen to a software engineering podcast in your spare time, so you're clearly passionate about technology. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. A $600 signing bonus from Hired when you find that great job that gives you the respect and the salary that you deserve as a talented engineer. I love Hired because it puts you in charge. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily and thanks to Hired for being a continued long-running sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Sacha, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks. Um, last year, you wrote an ultra-popular guide called A Study Plan to Cure JavaScript Fatigue. So let's start at the basics. What is JavaScript fatigue? So I didn't coin that term or anything, but the way I understand it is that people think there is you know, too many options, basically, that JavaScript is becoming too complex. And I think that's because it's maturing a lot and going towards being more of a professional, full-fledged programming language as opposed to its origins where it's, you know, it was used to add a little bit of interactivity in a page using jQuery or even vanilla JavaScript. You would want to have a cool effect when you click on a button or submit a form. And so it was a very different uh, use case from today where you, know, you have entire apps powered by JavaScript from A to Z. Right. It seems like that's the, the, the reason you made the state of JavaScript survey, which is to get a feel of what the current conditions are. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to see, first of all, for myself, like which libraries, not only which libraries and frameworks were popular, but also which ones people were actually enjoying, because I think that's sometimes very different. Like the famous example is Angular, where Angular got really, really popular, but then afterwards you had a backlash of people who weren't that happy with it. And I'm talking about like the old Angular uh, JS here. I've, I hear that the new one is a lot better. Yeah, I think I wanted to, to measure both things like use and also just uh, satisfaction. Right. So, and, and you actually, you know, you went much further than, than just the sort of front end JavaScript. You know, I'm just looking at the list here. You have JavaScript flavors, front end frameworks, state management, API layers, full stack frameworks, testing frameworks, CSS tools, like build tools. Like it's, it's very, very comprehensive. What, what was uh, sort of your high level takeaways from uh, the 2016 survey? Uh, I would say my main takeaway is that overall things aren't as bad as everybody seems to think they are. Like we hear a lot about you know, people complaining about JavaScript fatigue. But overall, the survey results indicated that people were pretty happy with the way uh, things were going. Like people using especially libraries like React or Vue 
had a very high satisfaction rate. Overall, people were pretty happy with like build tools and, and you know, other like state management libraries. Yeah, I think I was a bit surprised. I thought it would have been a lot worse than that. Right. And and I think in particular, I, I was personally quite interested in the CSS tools section. And I think you've, you've sort of focused on that as well. I think CSS tools in particular has seen a pretty, quite a lot of innovation. And Max Stoiber, for example, declared that we're in the component age. And that's um, quite a difference in a mode of, of, of integrating CSS and JS than the, the, the standard paradigm. So uh, just maybe talk a little bit about what are the main ways you see CSS tools evolving and maybe do we have CSS fatigue? So I actually wanted to be careful about that this year because a lot of these tools like Style Components, Glamour, and so on, they're all a React specific, right? So I, I'm a React user myself, but I'm not sure how much of that applies to the world outside React. Like, I don't know. Uh, you know, Vue, uh, Angular, Ember, I don't, don't really know what they're doing with CSS and if they're seeing the same, like, uh, shift to these new uh, ways of writing CSS. So um, I, I definitely think, like, for the React ecosystem, at least, there's a move towards things like Max's styled components. In fact, I'm using them myself, and I, I'm going through it right now, like, where I have to kind of question everything I know about CSS and rethink the, the way I write it, basically. But I, I, I don't know if that applies to like the, the, the web ecosystem at large yet. Right. I mean, that's the tricky thing because, you know, when you're surveying, you might introduce your own biases. And I, I see that, you know, for example, you went out of your way to not include all your Meteor audience to, to have an over-representation of Meteor <laughs> developers. Yeah, exactly. Like, you know, we, we have quite a big user mailing list from Discover Meteor, for example, and we didn't email it last year or, or this year because uh, I didn't want to bias the results towards media, for example. So uh, yeah, I, I tried to remove my own biases from the survey as much as possible, but obviously uh, it's not possible to do it completely and, and I'm limited by you know, what I know. Like I know React, so obviously I can be more granular in that domain compared to uh, Amber, which I know nothing about, for example. <laughs> yes. So. You know what? I guess what is different in the state of JavaScript 2017 survey? Um, like, what's new? What did you sort of consider when you put it together? So I would say the biggest difference is that we tried to collect a little bit more data about people who were responding, like the referrer, where they came from, uh, also like uh, geographic data. And that's not because we want to, you know, sell your data to advertiser or anything like that. It's just because we really want to see like if there are geographic trends or you know, if maybe people who found the survey through a React chat room, let's say, obviously their results will be biased towards React. So maybe if we know that, we can control for all these factors. So um, yeah, I would say the main thing is knowing more about the people answering the survey as, as an aggregate, you know, as anonymous data. And then the other thing, uh, we reworked some of the categories. Uh, by the way, when I say we, uh, I'm um, actually being helped by my friend Michael, who also lives uh, here in Japan. He's a really good JavaScript developer, and he has a site called bestoff.js.org, which is a super useful database of JavaScript libraries. And so he was the perfect person to, to help me out. So that, that would be the, the other change. Like now, I'm not doing it all by myself, which is a big help. That's fantastic. Just, just uh, t to sort of go back on that demographic point, is there any particular demographic you think you know, is underrepresented? And maybe we can sort of uh, call for you know, more representation here on this podcast. So, you know, it, it's, it's tough because last year uh, the results showed that a lot of people liked React, for example. So then people said that React developers were overrepresented because of the results. So I can't really disprove that, right? It's really hard to... Obviously, I didn't reach 100% of every single developer on the planet, so I, my survey won't be representative, and neither can I ensure that it has a cross-section of like every possible developer profile. So... It's really hard to say. I would say maybe enterprise developers or, or like, you know, people who might not check Hacker News or Reddit every day. Obviously, they will probably hear about the survey like later or, or not at all. So if you have any idea of how to reach out to, you know, people who might not be on Twitter, might not read Reddit. Yeah, that, that would be helpful. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there's occasional discussions of, you know, there's some 
developers that are open that work in open source and are very public like yourself and then there's there's this whole dark it's almost like dark matter of developers who sort of work quietly uh, in their own companies and uh, kind of you know don't don't really you know participate a lot in in a lot of this uh, open sort of community so it'd be really great to see what their you know preferences are and what they're developing like they're developing for the web they just don't participate in the rest of it so Let's, uh, let's, you know, I think a lot of people are trying to do developer surveys and yours is, you know, one of the more, more prominent ones. Obviously, we've seen some others like uh, Stack Overflow and I, I think there's one that's, that's pretty, pretty prominent from GitHub. What's, and yours is a very technical and very long survey. What's, uh, let's set some baseline for, for people trying to do surveys. Like, what are some sort of traffic numbers? What is your estimate of a completion rate? So I can probably look that up for you. I think we have a pretty good completion rate, like maybe 50%. I mean, this is my first and only survey like ever, so I'm probably not the right person to ask about that. I can only share my own uh, metrics. So, okay, it's taking a while to load. Okay, so 66% completion rate, average time to complete 12 minutes, and we have 14,600 responses so far. Amazing. And, and what, what sort of discussions has this led to? Like, have you, after you publish the results, you know, obviously everyone's sort of going over uh, this details and accusing you of, you know, biasing towards React. Like, <laughs> what are actual sort of interesting discussions that you've had with people who've, who've seen the results? So I guess there's two kind of discussions. There's the kind where people will tell me I'm biased and, and so on, and then I will reply back. And then there's a huge Twitter flame war and everybody goes home angry and that doesn't help anybody. So I wouldn't say, wouldn't call that very productive, uh, but I did hear from many more people who said that the survey helped like confirm their technological choices or maybe point them in the right direction. And that was really the goal from the start. Like, you know, I, obviously I'm not trying to tell you, okay, you have to pick React because React is the best. That's what I would choose myself, but I'm not trying to push anybody in that direction necessarily. It's more about giving you more elements, more data points to help you make your choice. That's, that's also why some, what I want to improve this year is, right, it's not trying to so much speak for every developer, but more tell you, okay, here's how people found the survey, here's the breakdown of people who answered the survey, and you can tell if, if these people match your own situation or not, and you can you know, take the data into account or maybe discount it based on that. Right, right. And, you know, no survey is perfect. But, you know, given that, uh, I think you, you talked a little bit about this, but like, is there any specific way it, it sort of, inf uh, the, the results informed you in your own development choices? Like, you know, you mentioned view is interesting to look at. Right. Well, I, I guess it did confirm that React is probably a safe bet. So uh, I've been all in in React for uh, the past year. I was already using React, but, you know, it's just nice to see, okay, other React developers are pretty happy. Uh, there's no, like, the house is not on fire, you know, there's no, like, huge catastrophe lurking a couple months from now, because that's what people always say, They're like, oh, well, React is cool now, but wait next year, and then we'll have the next flavor of the month, or Facebook will do this or that, and I think the survey shows that it's probably not going to happen, like, Re React people seem happy with it, it seems pretty stable, and we'll see this year if, if the, the new data confirms that trend, but... Uh, at least, yeah, I would say it brought me peace of mind regarding my technological choices. Got it. And, and do you have a general framework? So, for example, if someone says on Hacker News or somewhere that something is the hot new thing, how do you decide if it's worth paying attention to? Like, how, do you, how did you know that style components would be important? How do you, how do you decide whether something is even worth your time? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I think it depends on a couple of factors. Like, first of all, who's behind it? If it's somebody who's like, recognized in the community, that's really important. And then also like the, the justification they give for it. I remember when I first heard about style components, it wasn't just like, oh, here's a cool new thing. They, they were really explicit about what problem they were solving. They gave talks about the problems with CSS, with like BAM, with CSS modules. And so, you know, I feel a lot of developers will come up with something cool, but not really give the rationale behind it. So like, hey, here's a cool thing I made, and that, that's fine. But I think if you want to evangelize and convince people to give your thing a try, you really have to make it clear what problem it's solving. And that's something, you know, I'm not saying it's easy. That's something I struggle with myself for my own uh, open source projects. But 
uh, yeah, that's definitely a big factor, I think. Right. It sounds like it's the same as with sort of approaching businesses and, 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 and sort of book ideas. Like you just start with why and, and sort of let that guide your decision. Yeah, I think there's nothing like that special about open source compared to business or, or any, any other human endeavor. It's like always the same psychological principles at work. You have to convince people, you have to sell your product, you know, open source. People are not buying it with money, but they're buying it with their time. So it's still a big investment. Yeah, and, and uh, I think, you know, my last question on this, you have a very interesting sort of landing page where you, you let people sort of give their random comments and then you sort of cycle through them. And those are very entertaining. What is that? Do you have any favorite random comments? Yeah, I, I like there's one about Angular burning with the heat of a thousand suns or something. Well, what else? Yeah, there's a few, few nice ones. Uh, there's like a couple that are like, Ah, JavaScript is so horrible, and I hate you for making me fill out this survey. I'm looking forward to updating that section with the new uh, 2017 comments. Vivid Cortex is the best way to improve your database performance, efficiency, and uptime. It's a cloud-hosted monitoring platform that eliminates your most critical visibility gap providing insights at one-second granularity into production database workload and query performance. It measures the execution and resource consumption of every statement and transaction, so you can proactively fix future database issues before they impact customers. To learn more, visit vividcortex.com slash sedaily and find out why companies like GitHub, DigitalOcean, and Yelp all use Vivid Cortex to see deeper into their database performance. Learn more at vividcortex.com slash SE Daily and get started today with Vivid Cortex. Awesome. Uh, I really encourage uh, everyone listening to go check it out, stateofjs.com. But, you know, we're also wanting to talk about your other big sort of open source project, and that's Vulkan.js. So first of all, just for you know, the listeners who are, who are sort of more generalists, um, if I know the mean slash Mern stack, but I haven't used Meteor before, can I jump straight to Vulkan.js today? OK, so I, I guess I should start with explaining what Vulkan.js is. OK, that's actually not easy. But let's say that uh, <laughs> the problem I want to, start to solve, like let's go back to, to the why, the problem. I was really always very impressed with uh, WordPress because although it started out as a, a blog engine, there's a whole ecosystem that evolved around it. And you can now build like anything with it from real estate listing sites to, you know, uh, job boards to forums to basically anything you want. But at the same time, that comes at a cost, which is that you still have that legacy code base. It doesn't really follow like the most modern coding practices. I've always thought like, it would be so cool if there was something with the same ease of use and flexibility as WordPress, but based on more uh, modern technologies like React and GraphQL and so on. And so that's kind of what Vulkan JS is trying to do. Uh, give you a very easy way to get started with all these uh, really modern and productive libraries. So right now it's not as easy as WordPress. Uh, you still you know, need to know a decent amount of JavaScript and React and so on. But the goal eventually is to really have that ecosystem of plugins and themes and so on. And that's only possible if you have this common starting point, right? This common base. So that's what I'm trying to build. Like, uh, it's also a bit similar to, to Rails in that aspect, you know, like um, they call it convention over configuration, right? The idea that you have a starting point, you have some best practice that are well defined. And that's also something that a lot of people don't like about the current state of JavaScript, the JavaScript fatigue. It's that there's a lot of ways to do things, but it's not always clear what the best way or, or at least the, the, the way you should start with is. And that's also something I'm trying to address with Vulkan. There's this pendulum that swings back between opinionated and unopinionated. And some people like some things and some people like other things. And, <laughs> and there's, a little, there's a little bit of confusion there as to what's the best way forward is, especially in JavaScript. I, I, think, I think you're right in the Ruby and Rails world, like everything sort of resolved for you and you just kind of go and build stuff. Yeah, so, so practically speaking, Vulkan 
So currently it runs on top of Meteor. So Meteor is a, a full stack JavaScript framework. Uh, Vulkan doesn't use all of the Meteor features. It's kind of pretty minimalist in that aspect. So mainly Meteor is used as the, the build tool just to compile your JavaScript, minify it, and so on, and serve it. It's also used as a way to get access to Mongo database, because Meteor, the command line Meteor tool, just creates a Mongo database for you whenever you create a new Meteor app. So that's pretty handy. That's a really good way to get started. So we have Meteor as a base running a Mongo database as well. And then on top of that, we actually have a GraphQL server. So Although Meteor comes with its own uh, data layer thing, for Vulkan, we decided not to use it, or rather to, to migrate away from it towards GraphQL, because uh, GraphQL is a much more uh, common standard. And by adopting GraphQL, well, I mean, not only does GraphQL has its own advantages, but also since it's not tied down to Meteor, uh, it makes it a lot easier to port your app to a different stack uh, if you need to. And it makes it easier for us as well to maybe in the future evolve uh, away from Meteor. So that's for the server. And then on the client, we use uh, the Apollo client, which connects to your GraphQL endpoint, loads your data into Redux, and finally sends it to your uh, component stack using React. So, so that's about the whole thing. I guess I should uh, pause for now to see if you have any questions because I've been talking for a while. Sure. Well, and that and that sort of kind of leads into what my next question was going to be, which is um, obviously there's a, there's it, this is a full stack project and there's a lot of prior knowledge. And I think you're you're trying to I, I you know, I, I really appreciate that sort of WordPress analogy, which is I think you have the overall philosophy of you should you should get to get to some point where you don't have to understand everything about one particular component like you know, uh, and and you should you know just use it um, as a sort of like a black box to you. So I think some people you know we just mentioned React, Redux, GraphQL, Apollo, Mongo. You know they 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 sort of may feel a little overwhelmed when thinking about this. Like if I want to look at Vulkan, sort of what's what's actually necessary in terms of understanding and how uh, you know in in terms of just like getting functional. So the way I think about it is that you know there's a a big market of React developers who maybe don't have a, a really good backend stack to match their uh, React frontend. And so that, that's kind of uh, what Vulkan is made for, right? If you already know React, if you're familiar with like, you know, writing components, maybe using patterns like higher order components as well, uh, Vulkan will be very easy for you, I think, because most of your work will be setting up your frontend. And then there's um, a Graph the GraphQL part. So I also think it won't be too hard because GraphQL is uh, an up and coming standard anyway, so you might as well learn it. And then the, the last part is the, the Vulkan specific APIs. So I, I admit that this is kind of, uh, you know, can be a, a drag to learn because, you know, you're not going to use these things anywhere else. But there aren't too many of them, and uh, there's a pretty extensive documentation, there's examples. So uh, that, that's kind of the, the three uh, pillars. Of Vulkan, I would say, like React and then GraphQL and then the Vulkan stuff. Perfect. I mean, you know, my personal experience with the Vulkan APIs, you know, I've, I've, I've tried to implement the same exact thing in Meteor, and it's so much boilerplate that sort of goes away because I can use the Vulkan APIs in the higher order components. And that's, uh, you know, very convenient to use. And those are sort of, you know, often used in apps like Falcon JS is, is used for, you know, and, and that sort of leads me into, you know, what, what kind of full stack project is Falcon JS ideal for, uh, and maybe not so suitable for, like, for example, like the Falcon started life as Telescope, and you just wanted to make a sort of Hacker News clone, right? Yeah, so that's a good question. So first, let, let me let me recap what exactly Vulkan does. So there's like a couple of main features. First of all, everything in Vulkan is organized around uh, a schema. Each collection or, or model, I guess you could call them, has a, a schema. And the schema will, first of all, generate a GraphQL schema. So in GraphQL, usually you have to write out your own GraphQL schema. But, but with Vulkan, you can simply generate it from your JSON or, or JavaScript uh, basic schema. So that already saves you time. The other thing that you can do through that is uh, generate uh, forms. So that's also very handy because Vulkan will handle all the, the form uh, logic, the submission, the validation, and again, all that based on the types and uh, behaviors you define in your schema. 
So that, that makes Vulkan actually really good for any like uh, CRUD app, you know, any app where you need to display lists of documents, edit them, delete them, and so on. Things like, yeah, you can imagine like an Airbnb type site with lots of listings and different data types and they have to interact. You have to manage user accounts and so on. So all these things that are really common to a lot of apps, uh, that's what Vulkan tries to address. And then apps that Vulkan wouldn't be a good fit for. First of all, anything where you don't need to um, write data where you don't have user accounts, like maybe if it were just uh, a live dashboard that displays stats from the GitHub API, let's say. Vulkan will, wouldn't be a huge help because you couldn't use the forms uh, since you don't really have uh, your you know, your own uh, data models, maybe. I mean, yeah, you could probably still use it, but it wouldn't be a huge help. And similarly, anything like um, maybe like a game, something that's really, really custom, where with lots of custom mutations, actions, uh, methods that you're calling, Vulkan wouldn't be great for that. So, you know, Vulkan is really good for anything that's organized around basic actions, like creating new documents, editing documents, deleting documents. If it starts being really more granular, like, you know, very specific actions, then it doesn't help as much, I would say. Yeah, I, I, you know, I've played through the uh, example uh, applications that you've made, and I think the Instagram clone, you know, which which basically happens in, you can, you, can do, you can make an Instagram clone in 45 minutes, and, you know, you don't even feel like you're, you know, working that much to sort of make the forms uh, and put the forms together, and, and, and it just interacts so smoothly with data layer. I, you know, I, I thought that that was um, pretty remarkable and... Uh, you know, that thanks, I'm, thanks. I'm definitely going to do use Vulkan uh, if I ever have any projects that, that, that is similar. And, you know, and Vulkan is not just sort of Vulkan core. You have a lot of components that, that are meant to be sort of plug and play. You know, you recently released Vulkan JS 1.6, and that included an admin panel. Uh, previously, you had sort of payment rails. There's just a, uh, it's, and it's only been four months uh, since you, <laughs> since you launched Vulkan. Can you sort of recap what you what you've released so far, and sort of what's next in terms of the product roadmap? Well, I mean, it might be a bit misleading to say it's only been four months because Vulkan is a rebranding actually of a previous project called Telescope. So it's not like I wrote the whole thing in four months. It's more that over the years, uh, Telescope kept evolving. You know, I kept refactoring it, kept switching out pieces of it. And then it reached the point where I decided to just rebrand it because it didn't have that much to do with the original project. So yeah, the rebrand might be four months old, but I don't want to give the impression that the code base is just like has magically uh, appeared in four months because that would be pretty hard to do, I think. <laughs> but yeah, so one thing I'm really excited about is some uh, community members have been working on a command line utility. So currently you can, uh, well, you basically have to clone the, the main uh, Vulkan repository and you don't have a, a really easy way to kickstart a new project, but the command line utility will change that. You'll just be able to do like Vulkan new and that would be really cool. You'll also be able to create new models, create new packages, and it really it will really save you a lot of time just copying and pasting boilerplate code, basically. Right. So it's this sort of scaffolding concept that you see in other CLIs. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I did want to mention, I think highlight particularly, I think the payments to the payment component that you sort of release in 1.5. I, I don't think that's something that a lot of people tackle when they when they sort of make frameworks like this. Is there any sort of insights that you have, like it's uh, people using it and, and, and you know, how, how, did, how did you sort of put that together? So I basically built it for myself to use on a sidebar, sidebar.io, another project of mine. So if for those who don't know, sidebar is a newsletter of design links. And uh, one way I monetize it is through sponsored links. So people can, like once a week, I make one sponsor slot available if you want to promote your product. And for a while I was handling payment manually through PayPal, uh, but a couple of times I started receiving uh, checks in the mail and I was like, okay, I need to build a better integration because I don't want to have to go to the bank and try to deal with Japanese banks because I, I live in Japan, by the way, trying to cash uh, a US check. So um, yeah, I decided to just bite the bullet and look into Stripe's APIs. And it's actually super simple. Like the integration is, uh, is not very complex. It took me, you know, a couple of days, maybe a week or so to build. But a lot of time when I build these packages, it's not just as, 
you know, a, a finished product, but more as a starting point, you know, to give people uh, a place to contribute if they want to add features. Because otherwise, two people might be working on the Stripe packages independently and not know about it and then contribute to different implementations that are not compatible. So by, by adding my own very simple starting point, I ensure that uh, future contributors will kind of be able to coordinate using that as a base. Right, you sort of plant the flag and people can, can copy yeah, your example. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, see, you seem to make things, everything um, very, look very easy. Um, <laughs> is there a time that you got stuck? You know, you're, you're dealing with a lot of cutting edge, cutting edge technologies that are not necessarily that well documented. Like, what was the time when you got stuck and sort of what do you do to get out of that? Well, so yeah, I get stuck a lot. I'm lucky enough that uh, maybe I, I built up some credibility in the community. So I know people I can ask for help. And usually by the fourth or fifth time I ask, they, they'll answer me. <laughs> they just do it for you. <laughs> yeah, so maybe uh, other people, it would take them uh, seven or eight times. For me, it's a bit faster. But no, uh, yeah, the, I, I do get stuck a lot. There's things that there's part of uh, Vulcan that I didn't write myself. Uh, I relied on the members of the, the community, so that was a huge help. The, the Apollo and Meteor team are also very helpful when, when there's a problem. Yeah, overall, I don't know, it's a mix of being persistent and then also knowing when to let go. There's things that I know don't really work right now, but I've decided to just wait until the maybe Apollo or Meteor or React or whatever teams fix them. Because I know if if I take it upon myself to do it, it will take me like literally months of work. So that wouldn't be productive. So you have to, to pick your battles, basically. The process of troubleshooting bugs can be tedious and inefficient for developers, especially as they push more and more code to production. The unlucky developer assigned to bug duty may get bombarded with error alerts and spend hours figuring out which errors to address first. They might have to deal with logs to piece together what happened, or even spend time reaching out to other engineers on their team for help. Bugsnag improves the task of troubleshooting errors by making it more enjoyable and less time-consuming. For example, when an error occurs, your team can get notified via Slack see the diagnostic information on the error, and identify the developer who committed the code. Bugsnag's integration with Jira and other collaboration tools makes it easy to assign and track bugs as they are fixed. We have a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Try all features free for 60 days at bugsnag.com sedaily. Development teams can now iterate faster and improve software quality. To get started, go to www.bugsnag.com slash sedaily. Get up and running in three minutes. Airbnb, Lyft, and Shopify all use Bugsnag to monitor application errors. Try all features free for 60 days at bugsnag.com slash sedaily. Thank you, Bugsnag, for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It's much appreciated. So, I mean, since, given that you sort of brought up Meteor, I'm just going to sort of detour a little bit and talk about Meteor. So, so just first of all, let's, let's establish, uh, what is your relationship with the Meteor development group? So I don't have any uh, relationship. Yeah, th thanks for asking, because that's something I wasn't clear enough about in the past. Like sometimes people think, because I co-wrote a Discover Meteor book about Meteor with Tom Coleman. And so we were both very involved in the community. And MDG, the company behind Meteor, was a huge help in promoting the book. So because of that, a lot of people started thinking that we were part of MDG and that we were like speaking for them. But that's definitely not the case. Like uh, We work together in the sense that they might link to my content and I might write about Meteor and I might use Meteor. But that, but that's it. There's no like uh, financial relationship or employee or even consultant relationship of any sort. So... Basically, what I'm trying to say is anything I say, I'm only speaking for myself and definitely not speaking for them. 
Right. I think it's, it's very clear, and uh, I did want to give you that opportunity to, to make that clear here as well. So, so you know, just, just in that, the, the question I really want to ask is, you, you know, you, you describe Vulcan.js as your way of meteorizing GraphQL and, and sort of taking the, the, the meteor approach, which, which you know, I, I love and you love. What I don't understand is, I guess, is, is MDG disagreeing in terms of, like, why are they not building Vulcan.js, basically? What is the sort of philosophical disagreement? So I think what happened is that when Meteor first started out, like I was there basically from the start. So I remember the, they used to have like a Trello roadmap and that roadmap had things like uh, forms, uh, routing, server-side rendering. And those things were like in the, you know, six months column or one year column or whatever. And so everybody was like, oh great, Meteor is gonna do all these cool things for us. And everybody was super happy. But then what happened is that like reality struck and I think MDG realized that it, it wasn't really doable to take on all these challenges plus uh, building the rest of Meteor, like the, the package management system, the build tool, the data layer, the front end layer. And yeah, they just had to make some tough choices and some features uh, got you know left by. And then what happened later on is that uh, I think they started the Apollo project and re they realized their strengths lay in the data layer domain. And so they, they kind of refocused their energies towards that. And at the same time, Meteor itself is trending towards becoming more of a, maybe like a build tool, like basically a, a development environment for JavaScript. And I think it is going to do a great job at that. But that does leave this space in the middle for something like Vulkan that actually handles like forms and routing and so on. So I don't think it's, it's partly philosophical, but I think it's mostly practical. Like they just had to make some choices because uh, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're a real company. They have to make money somehow at some point, unlike me. So they can't afford to like, uh, just, you know, be, be too, um, you know, unfocused, I guess. Well, we're gonna we're gonna mention the, the making money part later on, but thank you for answering that that that, that, that question. And and sort of going coming back to Vulkan JS, you know, it's it's not just you. Uh, you mentioned there's actually significant parts of Vulkan that were made by contributors. Vulkan JS is six thousand GitHub stars and one hundred and sixty six contributors, and and I, you know I, I consider that pretty successful for you know an open source project. What is your advice in terms of for other maintainers in sort of attracting good contributors? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, to be honest, that's still something I'm trying to do. I think at the end of the day, like if you make something, let's say like style components, uh, something that's fairly self-contained that addresses a pretty like uh, well-defined market, like React developers that solves a well-defined need. You have a, a great core team. That's like the perfect recipe. And I feel like Vulkan is kind of the opposite because it's not as well-defined. It's uh, it's basically uh, you have to be all in. You can't just add Vulkan to an existing project. It's a lot larger scoped. So Vulkan is in a way kind of a counter example of what not to do if you want to have a successful open source project, I would say. Yeah, but you're sort of building your own world. I think, and I think uh, you recognize that, which is why you're, you're so active in the Vulkan Slack channel. Do you think Slack in, or, or Gitter is, you know, and I think those the sort of chat uh, free chats basically have been, I guess, replacing IRC uh, in terms of doing, you know, discussions. Uh, but you know, I think a lot of uh, support is being done for Vulcan in the Slack channel. Do you think it's effective, or like, is there a better way? I think there probably is a better way because Slack. The problem is that none of the conversations persist or are searchable or indexable. So I think like a forum like Discourse is probably better overall. For Vulkan specifically, like, you know, what I want to do is have a, a closer relationship with users and contributors because I consider the project to still be in flux. So I'm really interested to know what problems people run into. I want to be able to, like, address their issues pr pretty quickly. I think Slack is really good for that. Like, it's more informal also. So, like, people will be less hesitant to share their questions or problems or, or, or anything. But overall, for a more mature project, I don't think it's that good. So it really depends, I would say, the face of your project. If, if you have something like, a, you know, let's say WordPress again, where I, I assume that the APIs are fairly stable, probably want something more like a knowledge base where people can uh, answer something and then the answer stays there 
our future users. Awesome. I think that's a that's a really good way to sort of think about the evolution of a of a project like this. So yeah, let's maybe close it out with a, a pitch for contributors. Um, what opportunities can you highlight for contributors to work on in Vulkan.js? I wouldn't call for contributors. I would call for people who actually use Vulkan for a real world project because. In my experience, if you don't have a reason to use an open source project, you're not going to contribute very long. You're going to maybe do like a, a short push because it's interesting, but then, you know, life gets in the way, you have to pay the bills, and then you'll drop out. On the other hand, if you're um, actually using Vulkan for a real world project, you might not contribute for the first year or two years or whatever, but sooner or later, you know, you'll if your project is successful, then you might come across something that you want to do that Vulkan doesn't do yet, and you can develop it for yourself and then uh, open source it. So I think that's a much more sustainable approach. Yeah, uh, obviously, if people are interested in contributing, uh, they're interested in technology, that, that's awesome. But at the same time, uh, I think uh, the, the first step is using it for yourself and you know buying in into the, the Vulkan uh, vision, I would say, uh, if that makes sense. Totally. I mean, it was it was interesting. I think yesterday you posted an example of a development agency that actually made a tutorial about Vulkan, and basically, you know, they're they're basically basing their entire agency on Vulkan, or I guess it's one of their their tools, and that's that was amazing to see uh, personally. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was awesome to see. Um, I, I don't think they're basing their whole agency on Vulkan. That <laughs> even even yeah, even I would say okay, but probably. <laughs> wait a little bit, but yeah, no, that was awesome to see. Definitely. Um, I'm hoping more and more people start, you know, doing videos, tutorials. Yeah. I think Vulkan is at the stage where people can definitely do that. Like the APIs are pretty stable. I think it's just up to me to kind of put it forward a bit more. Like it was a deliberate choice. Like I kept the landing page very low key. I, I haven't tried to advertise it anywhere because I wanted to make sure that, you know, I could. Yeah, I guess beta test it for a couple months first, but now I think it's starting to reach the, the stage where I think it can be exposed to the the broader world. So I'm really curious to see what the next couple months bring for Vulcan. Yeah, and hopefully people will be interested to check it out after this uh, podcast. So uh, we're gonna sort of spend the last ten minutes or so talking a little bit about your situation, which is also super unique. You know, you're you're a solo designer, developer, and entrepreneur. And we're just going to talk a little bit about independent life. How's, how's that? Sure, yeah. So first question, why are so many of you in Japan? So many of us? Like, <laughs> who else is in Japan? Like, you know, you, you mentioned so your collaborator on uh, State of JS. Uh, you've got Patrick McKenzie. I, I, and I've seen, I've seen every now and then, you know, like sort of web developers who are prominent online, but then and they, and they sort of work remotely or on, on sort of bootstrap projects or on a consulting basis uh, based in Japan. And I always thought that was an interesting trend. Yeah, I think Japan is a country with uh, a big like, you know, influence culturally throughout the world. So whether it's martial arts or manga or anime or whatever you want, like there's a lot of people who come to Japan or to Japanese culture for these reasons and then maybe visit the country and meet a Japanese uh, girl or man and fall in love and move here and so on. That's a pretty common story. So that's not what happened to me. Like um, I actually moved here because my wife, who is also French, is uh, doing her PhD or actually just completed her PhD here in Osaka. I, yeah, I don't have the same connection maybe, but I also really liked Japan even before. So um, yeah, I think it's just a country that attracts a lot of people. And then maybe you maybe you get confirmation bias somehow. Like you, whenever somebody is living in Japan, you can uh, pick it up. But yeah, that's uh, that, it. Would be interesting. Like I have a friend, um, Bamu, who runs a site called Candy Japan. One time, uh, he made a post about whether Japan is uh, overrepresented on Hacker News in like uh, blog post titles or, or blog post topics, like to see if people had a disproportionate interest towards Japan. I, I'm not sure I remember the conclusion, but I think it did show a little bit of bias. So. Yeah, I, I, I mean, even I picked up on it. I, I don't know. I thought it was an interesting question. So, you know, and maybe uh, let's talk a little bit about, you know, you started as a designer and, and, and then you incrementally got more and more into sort of developing. Your first, and your first solo success was a book about step-by-step -step UI design, which I think, you know, kicked off your uh, entrepreneurial journey. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and so personally, you know, 
design is is pretty intimidating if you just come from development. Like as far as I'm concerned, you know, I learn the bare minimum CSS and, and Bootstrap, and then everything, every site that I make kind of looks the same. <laughs> Whereas you know, for for yeah. sites for projects like yours, like even if your name's not on it, and like I I don't see any logos or anything, I can tell that you did it. You have a very oh, unique, really? you have a very unique look. How do you? You know, just in general, like how do you? Uh, I, and I think that's something that I would aspire to personally. How would you encourage sort of developers to to go beyond Bootstrap and 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 add some design, but you know, not be not becoming full designers? Yeah, I mean, it just takes time. Like, uh, I'm not sure there's any like specific shortcut or, or method. I think you know, one thing that's helped me a lot is I always put out a lot of side projects. So rather than have a single big project like let's say sidebar it would take me like a month or two months to redesign it and you know i'll agonize over every decision if i put out like a landing page for state of js i can go in a completely different direction i can try new fonts new new ideas and then it will only take me like a week two weeks to to build that landing page so um, that's something that's helped a lot i think just iterating over a lot of different projects with different styles so practice makes perfect. <laughs> yeah, practice makes perfect, and then practicing many different styles and many different projects, basically. So I actually told people that I was interviewing you, and I had uh, had someone actually ask this question. So I'm asking on behalf of him, and it's it's, it's pretty it's pretty uh, related, which is you know you, you have so many parts of the the of you know projects that you that you handle what do you approach first like what's your sort of process and his example was you know in the case of making web apps sometimes you go design first and then you you sort of build out uh, the data layer others sort of you know you you build out sort of the back end and then you put together the the UI how do you, how do you sort of drive your iterations so i feel I, I always want to start with like something that runs in the browser like a uh, hello world so if i start a new vulkan project like i want to Create create that home component or route or or any or if it's a landing page, I want to display something in the browser. I really don't like working on something while it's still like virtual in a way. So usually, what what I'll do is yeah, I'll launch a new Vulkan project or Gatsby project or whatever. Then just get to the point where something shows up in the browser. Maybe start writing some content, and then it's a back and forth uh, between the browser a uh, design program like Figma, which I really like uh, these days. Also just um, writing text out in a text editor or uh, Google Docs, it depends. And then, yeah, because the thing is I work by myself, you know, most of the time or maybe with one other person, but I don't have to have a super rigid like waterfall or uh, agile or whatever workflow, right? I can um, I can basically just go back and forth and, and kind of insert elements as I need them. So I might do 50% of the design in the browser and then I'm like, oh, I need some icons or I need a logo and then I'll go to a, a design app for a while and then come back and so on. So um, yeah, that's kind of my process. It's very messy. There's not a lot of structure, but seems to get the job done, I guess. It works for you. Yeah. But like it, it can be, uh, you know, I've been trying to collaborate more with other people recently and sometimes it's like, well, okay, I, I have, I reach a point where I'm like, I realize that my habits might not fit that well with other people. So that's definitely uh, something you have to be conscious of if you are, you have this very kind of uh, in the idiosyncratic workflow. Got it, got it. And, and you also write, you also have sort of broader thoughts on being a solo sort of entrepreneur. And I was pretty interested to read about the spider web strategy. Do you want to maybe talk a little bit, little bit about what that is and, and how that sort of informs uh, how you sort of think about the, the range of projects that you're doing? Sure. So so that's um, a blog post I wrote a couple of years ago to explain like a, maybe a philosophy or, or a way of seeing things when it comes to products and being like a, an independent entrepreneur. Basically, I saw a lot of people struggling because they couldn't monetize products. So it's always like, oh, how do I, should I raise prices? Should I, um, you know, charge a fixed sum? Should I try charge a subscription? And sometimes I think not all products are meant to be monetized and it's perfectly fine to have uh, products that are sitting on the edge of your spider web and their goal is just to drive people to the center where the, you're waiting to for them to devour uh, them. <laughs> that was kind of my metaphor in the in the post but yeah it doesn't have to be creepy of course you can just have like some 
other product in the same space or uh, maybe a, an ebook or something and that's the thing that you do monetize so the the gist of it was you don't have to make money off every single thing it's fine to view your entire product range as you know a thing that works together to drive people to a certain point right and it's and they all sort of reinforce each other do you have do you have a, a sort of inspiration or role model or mentor that maybe you've seen that works successfully uh, pretty well and you you know I think I think you had a podcast with Nathan Barry uh, a couple years ago too and, and I think you guys were at the similar stage and, and, and it was a very interesting discussion uh, around how you guys were arranging your sort of product range as, as you call it yeah so I, I guess he went all in on a single product like convert it and he's doing a lot better than me so maybe don't listen to me after all uh, but anyone else I, I guess in terms of programming or design or just business so you mentioned Patrick McKenzie earlier, so that he's always been like pretty inspirational in terms of his attention to details and like optimization. I mean, I don't do any of that, but it's like still admire him. Who else? Yeah, Nathan Barry. Um, uh, I really like Tim Ferriss. I'm always jealous of him because uh, he's like always finding the best way to do every single thing. Uh, at least that's the way it seems. Super optimized life. Yeah, yeah. I'm not really that way, but yeah, I, I kind of... That's that's my like, my ideal. Maybe in the next life, I can reincarnate as Tim Ferriss. Well, I think you know both of you speak Japanese and you like jujitsu, so I, I'm pretty sure he speaks it better than me. I might I might be better than him at jujitsu. I don't know how much he prices. I think you should. I think you should definitely yeah. challenge him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll need to train a little bit first. Awesome. I, so I think that's uh, that's about all we have time for. Shall we uh, end with some calls to action? Well, go take the State of JavaScript survey if you haven't done so already. What else? Uh, Vulcanjs.org if you want to check it out. I probably did a horrible job of explaining what it is and what it does, but there's uh, documentation, there's videos, so that will uh, be more helpful. And you, I think the YouTube channel was pretty good as well. Yeah, there's a YouTube channel. I'm also going to announce uh, a new project that I haven't mentioned to basically anybody other than you so far which is an uh, indie dojo. So hopefully by the time you hear this, the page will be live at indiedojo.co. And that's going to be a, a boot camp, basically like a one-week coding camp in Japan, except instead of teaching you coding, we'll teach you uh, bootstrapping, basically. So everything you need to know to, or not maybe not everything, but like the basics that you need to know to launch your own business and to be an independent entrepreneur, including validating your idea, basics of design, branding, basics of user acquisition, content marketing, how to launch a product, all these things. So it will be a pretty intense one-week boot camp. And uh, yeah, we're doing this for the first time. So I'm doing it with uh, a friend, Magic, who already organizes code camps. We just had this idea, like, why not try to teach, teach people something else than just coding? Like, try to teach them the whole package. So uh, yeah, go check out indiedojo.co if you want to come to Japan. The camp will be in November this year, so pretty soon. We'll see what happens. I guess it's an experiment. That's a complete surprise to me. And just to clarify on the, the sort of target audience, um, would these people be current programmers, software engineers who have maybe launched some side projects but want to sort of go full time? Or, or yeah, are you exactly. also targeting complete newbies? No, uh, the ideal audience is somebody who already has a product or a product idea, who has some programming skills, but is really lacking in like the other areas, like feels limited by their lack of branding knowledge and marketing knowledge and so on. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's uh, something a lot of people are interested in. I'm sure I'm, we're going to hear a lot more about that as, uh, as you sort of proceed. So I'm definitely going to check it out, uh, indiedojo.co. Yeah, and indie spelled uh, I N D I E. Yes, <laughs> and and I, I, and I'm personally going to plug such as personal site. You know, I, I like I mentioned about your sort of design uh, aesthetic. Um, it's I think it's very clear when I when I look at your site, like what you're up to, and the things that you've done, and it's just not. It, it just makes makes it such a pleasure to just kind of scroll through and Thanks. Thanks. check everything out. And you know, I admire a lot of the stuff that you've done uh, in the JavaScript community, and you know, hope to sort of aspire to be like that one day <laughs> yeah um, i mean that, that that means a lot to me so thanks and by the way the site is built with uh, style components which we were talking about earlier right right awesome well so thanks very much for coming on software engineering daily 
Yeah, thanks for having me. Simplify continuous delivery with GoCD, the on-premise, open-source, continuous delivery tool by ThoughtWorks. With GoCD, you can easily model complex deployment workflows using pipelines and visualize them end-to-end with the value stream map. You get complete visibility into and control over your company's deployments. At gocd.org slash sedaily, find out how to bring continuous delivery to your teams. Say goodbye to deployment panic and hello to consistent, predictable deliveries. Visit gocd.org slash sedaily to learn more about GoCD. Commercial support and enterprise add-ons, including disaster recovery, are available. Thanks to GoCD for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. Wow! 